Well, these were, in a sense, the social categories with which one reasoned in terms of political economy, and they were all gone. And that's the reason why that period from the beginning of the French Revolution up until, you could say, maybe even 1830, was probably the most productive period in which new ideologies and new ways of understanding how, the, how life might be organized came up. And it's because a previous vocabulary had failed you. Now, supposedly, you know, one, one could say, perhaps, off the top of my head, that the kind of, at least the hyper-neoliberal vocabulary has uh, proven sterile in the world, proven, has failed us, and that one is going to have to find a new way of talking about political economy. I, I, it's a good question. I tried, I tried to think this through in a, in a particular kind of way. So, uh, so I have a kind of answer for, for your question. So one way of posing it is if you imagine, for example, someone in 17th century rural <coughs> India who's never left the village, who's a member of an untouchable caste, their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents are part of this untouchable caste. There has always been the caste system. They have nothing to compare it with. They've never left the village. They have no books to read. They have, they, in a sense, they are, if you like, immersed in a social order which they've experienced and which they know no alternative to and which the history of their village has always encoded. The question is, can these people think their way out of that hierarchy and that oppression? And uh, the answer is yes. And the answer is without <coughs> leaving the caste order, you can do two things, which people actually do. One of them is to imagine a world turned upside down, in which the lower castes become the high castes, and the high castes become the lower castes. In folk culture, you find this again and again. And this is enacted, actually, in lots of folk festivals all over the world, carnival and so on, in which the world is turned upside down. And these, er, these ceremonies have historically often been the scenes of revolt as well. It's just not play. The second thing is, of course, is to negate the caste order to imagine a world in which there are no castes, in which everyone is equal. So for example, the English, there's something called the, the popular conception of the Norman yoke. Uh, the English working class imagined that before the Normans came, all, uh, the, all the population of England was all equal. And it was only the Normans that, that created an aristocracy. So they created an historical myth. It wasn't the case, of course. But they created an historical myth in which all Englishmen were free and equal uh, in the period before the Normans came. So they were able, by, by negating the, the order or by turning it upside down, they were able to, in a sense, play with the existing hierarchy and either negate it or reverse it uh, without any external reference. That is, they didn't need a Marxist-Leninist cadre to come to tell them this was a bad thing. They didn't need an NGO. Uh, they might need some sense for the, for the possibility that they might have a chance of winning. Mm -hmm. That's, in a sense, what outsiders provide, a chance of, for allies and, and so on. Um, so in a sense, the role of the intelligentsia in social change, it seems to me its best role, came in the solidarity movement in Poland in which the intelligentsia came to the working class that was already in rebellion, in a sense, and said, what can we do for you? Can, we can tell you about the legal code. We know a lot about the legal code. We know a lot about the Constitution. We can tell you how to frame your, if you want to make a case in court, we can tell you how to do that. We can tell you uh, about the local regulations and legal codes, uh, and so on. And so they became, if you like, the kind of intellectual auxiliary uh, a think tank doing explicitly the instructions of the working class rather than telling them what to think of themselves. Uh, I'll be quick because in the sense the last two questions addressed um, what I was going to ask you and you give a partial answer. 
I was surprised um, after your wonderful presentation of these uh, forces of harmonization in the neoliberal project that you presented uh, that you presented NGOs as uh, the basis of contestation. And then you sort of undid that because NGOs, I mean, to put it very crudely, I mean, there's the sort of secular missionaries as the wonderfully famous article uh, termed them about six years ago that argued all the human rights stuff. And then there's, again, to be very crude, the NGOs that are the service delivery sector of um, states that have been little bad by the international institutions that you speak of. So for someone who has written so eloquently and has had such an influence on us on identifying forms of resistance and hidden transcripts and so on, I was surprised to, I, I think, oh my gosh, you really can see that they've won, they've won. If the NGOs are the point of conversation, then that that neoliberal project is even more successful than, than we imagined. Um, so I was going to ask you, do you see any other sources or any other cracks or any other um, places from which an alternative can spring? And I think the other previous two questions have, have asked similar things. Well, you know, they're, they're, uh, if I were to be serious about this, I think I, you know, in a, in a talk of this kind, I piled all the NGOs into one heap and didn't start making uh, distinctions between uh, NGOs. There are huge distinctions to be made, and it seems to me that, that Western-funded NGOs uh, are, uh, to give you an example, I've just read a study of uh, women's NGOs uh, in India, and they distinguish between the Scandinavians are extremely active in women's NGOs in India, uh, do a lot of funding. Uh, and uh, this person noticed that the Scandinavian funded NGOs are working on all of those issues that are most important to Scandinavian women's groups. That is to say, spousal abuse and so on. And they're not interested so much in subsistence issues of livelihoods, that would probably be much more important for women's emancipation. However, there are in India NGOs that are local membership groups that don't have any, that, that, that get subscriptions from local women uh, that operate in a completely different way, some of which, uh, some of which have intelligentsia help. Um, and so I, I would want to create a whole series of distinctions between different kinds of NGOs and the degree to which they are carriers of a Western module or not. But the general question, I guess, is, is development the noun that we use in place of what would have been the word civilization uh, or even Christianity uh, 40 years ago? And can we, in a sense, if we replace right, uh, uh, one with the other, uh, how closely do they map onto one another? I haven't actually done this, but I think they map onto one another in a way that would surprise and dismay us. <laughs>